Jesus, Paul says, was handed over to die because of our sins. And he was raised to life to make us right with God. That's the picture of justification, to be made right. Therefore, because of that, Paul says, since we have been made right or since we have been justified in God's sight by faith, we have peace. Everybody say peace. Peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege. Would you say that with me? Undeserved privilege or access where we now stand and we confidently and we joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Because of Jesus, we experience, Paul says here, peace and access like never before. Peace with God, not just the peace of God. The peace of God is a beautiful thing, but here in this context, he's talking about peace with God. No condemnation. He's speaking of the reality of our forgiveness, of grace, mercy, and freedom from the weight of a guilty conscience. We have been declared not guilty. I'm going to need three volunteers. Judy Cox, thank you very much. Matt Terabessi, I appreciate that volunteering. Would you please join me down here? Uh, let's see here. Eric, you want to come down here? Come on, volunteer. Here you go. I didn't, I didn't volunteer. No, you oh, didn't. Yeah. You didn't volunteer. None of you did. So uh, <laughs> you guys watch what Matt has to go through because you're going to do this over here, okay? All right, so we're going to come right over here. I don't want you to lock eyes with the people here. Okay. And you get the gavel. And I want you to declare them not guilty. Let's just look them in the eyes. <laughs> Name all of them. No, just kidding. Not guilty. Have a little bit more fun with it. Louder. Not guilty. Thank you. Hallelujah. Okay. Eric? Right over that direction. Eric, no, you're going to come over here with that table. Come on. You're going to look this group right here in the eyes. You've got to get them far enough forward, Sam, so he doesn't... You have to look past the lights, all right? So you get to be the judge for the moment. Lock, him, lock eyes with them. <laughs> Not guilty. Feels pretty good, doesn't it? I'm a little nervous to give Judy this gavel. <laughs> She's been waiting a long time. Hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you all. Now think about how good that feels, just as a human being getting to look others in the eyes. Try to remember this when you're on 28 and, par and the parkway this week, okay? <laughs> When we finally get a hold of this, there's this picture that Paul talks about here of when we finally inherit all of the glory, all of creation will be set free from corruption and we will have freedom to be our true selves at last. Paul says that we have peace with God, declared not guilty and he also says that we have undeserved privilege. It's translated access in other translations. For the Jews and the Gentiles who would have been reading that, we miss this with our Western eyes and our Western understanding, but in that moment, the Jews that were a part of this fledgling church in Rome and the Gentiles that were part of this young church in Rome 
they would have immediately begun to get a hold of what was happening here. You see, the Jews, they were kept from God's presence by the veil in the temple. The veil that had been ripped from top to bottom by God Almighty when Jesus breathed his last and said, it is finished, not guilty. The Jews were no longer kept from God. They had undeserved privilege. They had direct access to God. And the Gentiles, when you went to the temple back in those days, the Gentiles were kept out by a wall in the temple. It wasn't just a curtain, it was a wall. And it had a sign on it, and it warned that any Gentile who went beyond that wall would be killed. And so now the Gentiles were no longer on the outside, they were on the inside. And because of what Jesus had done, there was no longer Jew, Greek, male, female, all one at the foot of the cross, and because of Jesus, not guilty. Paul says that we stand in this access. We stand in grace, not in law. You see, justification has to do with our standing before God. Sanctification, another big theological term, sanctification has to do with our state. Both of those things are true as we come to to follow Jesus. The child of a king can enter his father's presence no matter how the child looks. The word for access here means entrance to the king through the favor of another. So when we talk about being stepping into the new throughout this series, we have a new standing because of Jesus before God. And it's awaiting its full expression of the glory of God. We are adopted into the family, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. No need to go to another person to gain an audience with our heavenly father. You don't need me to talk directly to your creator. You don't need me to declare you not guilty. You don't need me or anyone else to absolve you. The risen Savior has done that for you. You have direct access to God Almighty, and you can read his word for yourself, and the Holy Spirit helps you to understand that. Peace, I love what Warren Wiersbe said about this text. He said, peace with God. Take... excuse me, takes care of our past. He will no longer hold our sins against us. Access to God takes care of our present. We can come to him at any time for the help we need. Hope of the glory of God takes care of the future. One day we shall share in his glory. Good news. So is the next part. Now, the next part can be hard to believe. But when you've lived long enough and you've gone through enough pain and through enough hardship, you can begin to look back and see for yourself what Paul describes. We continue in verse 3. He says, we can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials. We can rejoice, he said, he says, when we experience sufferings. For we know that they help develop endurance or perseverance. And endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment. It won't lead us to shame. For we know, in other words, we've learned, we recognize how dearly God loves us. Why, how do we know that? Why do we know that? Look at what Paul says. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit, to fill our hearts with his love. Paul says, because of Jesus, we experience confidence and love like never before. There is a fact, there is a truth 
It's a hard truth. It's a difficult fact. But the reality is that we will run into problems, trials, and suffering. And if you've heard or hear a version of Christianity that claims otherwise, run. Because the reality of life as well as Jesus, our master and our king, taught us that. And if Jesus didn't escape it, then how could we expect to be unscathed by suffering, by trials, by difficulties, by pain? He told us that we'd have loss. Jesus said that we would be misunderstood, that we would undergo persecution, that we would be enveloped by difficulty, disappointment, discouragement, and abandonment in this world. He didn't want us to be confused. He didn't want us to to have a, a version of following him that was just up and to the right all the time because he knew that wouldn't be the reality, and so he set expectations clearly. Now, here's the fruit of that assurance that suffering produces, as Paul says, perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. It is a lifelong process, a slow growth journey. But don't despair. Embrace it. It's tough. It's hard. But refuse to allow, with the power of the Holy Spirit, refuse to allow the difficult and the painful parts of life to erode your confidence. That's what the enemy of your soul wants to do. He wants to erode your confidence. He wants to convince you that God does not love you, that you are unlovable, that you are overlooked, that you are unredeemable, that you are unreachable, that he has lost interest in the circumstances of your life. That's what your enemy of the soul wants. It's why we need community, because we don't go around the painful suffering difficulties. We don't go over it or under it. We go through it. But we don't go through it alone. We have, Paul says, a deep-seated joy that is given to us by Jesus. He sent his Holy Spirit to fill us with his love, not the emotional, sensational, fickle, selfish love of this world. He sent his love that is full of patience, kindness, goodwill, that is humble and honorable and selfless and truthful, a love that always protects, always trusts, always perseveres. That's the kind of love and confidence that he offers us today. So who is it right now in your life that's hard for you to love? This is where the practical application of this comes. And I want to pray for us. Would you bow your heads? Spirit of a living God, right now, you know the situations that we're facing. It is not by accident that we are here today. And Lord, some of us are going through a very difficult, painful time of suffering. And confidence could be eroded or has been eroded. And we're here today to be reminded that you've sent your Holy Spirit to enable us to walk through those sufferings, those trials. Some of us, Lord, we've been persecuted this day and this week. It's a season where we are feeling abandoned, where we're asking, are you there, God? Where are you, God? We're struggling to wait well while you do the work behind the scenes, cultivating perseverance, long suffering, strength and courage. Some of us, Lord, we're here today and we're tired. Life is just exhausting. 
the layers of complexity in our homes, the layers of difficulty in relationships, the tensions and the pressures to perform at work, to navigate a faith that is persecuted in a workplace? Would you be our protector? Would you be our provider? Would you be our comforter and our counselor, Holy Spirit? Help us, Lord, in those difficult situations to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Father, for those that are in a difficult, painful parenting season right now, things are feeling out of control, sleepless nights, uncertainty and anxiety are gripping our hearts. By the power of your Holy Spirit, would you breathe a peace that passes understanding into our weary souls, into our anxiety-filled minds. Would you help us to take every thought captive to the supremacy and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Lord, hear the cries of my brothers and sisters. Hear the prayers of your sons and your daughters crying out to you even right now in these moments. Renew our confidence. Restore that love that always protects, always trusts, always perseveres. Grow us and develop us in the weakness. Your power is made, made, is made perfect. We can't do it without you, Holy Spirit. Do what only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. There's just a little bit more good news I got to share with you. He continues in verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, when we were utterly, completely powerless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners, for us ungodly, for me right here for you right there, for those of you sitting at home. Christ showed his great love for us by sending, God, excuse me, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us, not while we were okay, not while we were not half bad, while we were still sinners, broken, marred, enemies of God, far from God. And since we have been made right, since we have been justified, since we have been declared not guilty in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God, in other words, we've been reconciled, was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice, notice this, in our wonderful new relationship with God. Because of our Lord Jesus Christ, who made us, help me out, friends of God. Because of Jesus Paul says we experience a depth of relationship like never before. Our Heavenly Father went first. He always goes first. He always initiates. He always has the perfect timing. Notice those phrases. God showed us his love. He demonstrated his love. He just didn't feel loving toward us. No, he said, I want to have relationship. I want to have restored, reconciled relationship with my creation. And he did it through the cross and in the resurrection, the shedding of blood that was required. The payment was made in full 
for us to have friendship with God. Restoration, there's no distance. It's up close and personal because of Jesus. We have this depth of relationship with God. Our side of that, he's got his side, our side of that, of this new friendship with God requires faith, trust, surrender, obedience, and a committing of our lives, our time, our talents, our treasures. We daily walk worthy, submitting to his words, his will, and his way. Little increments every day. The process of becoming like Jesus. Sanctification. Be with Jesus. Become like Jesus. And then we do what Jesus did. Some of you have heard this story, but many of you haven't. When I was in college, it was my sophomore year, and I ran into a friend who, actually he wasn't a friend, he was kind of an enemy back in junior high and early high school. He persecuted me, he mocked me, he made fun of me because I was the nerdy Jesus guy. Imagine that, me a nerd. Don't, it's, nothing's changed. We're in an Old Testament class. It's been two or three years since I've seen him. In a, a, a state university, I see him and I think, you know, things have changed. We're no longer in high school. I'm gonna share my faith with this guy. Came up, sat down. We were in class. I was shocked to see him in this Old Testament class, like, you know, the guy that you would think would never be there. Anybody got that? Maybe you were that person in high school. <clears throat> So we walk out of class, and I'm saying, hey, where's the party this weekend? Because that, that was the guy that he was. And I uh, invited him to come back to my uh, dorm. We were gonna have lunch together. I said, so where's the party this weekend? He said, I wouldn't know. I don't party anymore. I said, what? He said, no, I found Jesus, and he changed my life. I was like, man, I wanted to lead you to Jesus. <laughs> And I was attending this guy at one church and he was attending another church and we invited one another to each other's churches and he finally came to mine and I went to his. And here's what I remember about these early days and weeks with my friend Stephen. I knew the scriptures inside and out for a 20, 21 year old at that age appropriate. I've been following Jesus my whole life looking to go into ministry. He'd been following Jesus for about 30 seconds at the time that I met him, comparatively speaking. And I had all the facts and I had all the knowledge and I had all the, the attendance and all the, I was the good boy. And what I discovered was that Stephen had experienced Pentecost in a way that I had not. The spirit of Jesus lived within me and indwelt me, but the spirit of Jesus had not come, the Holy Spirit had not come upon me like he had in the life of Stephen. And because of that, there was a depth of relationship. And as I begin to understand that and begin to explore that and begin to investigate that, I ask my heavenly father, to send that same Holy Spirit upon me that he sent upon Peter and James and John and eventually the Apostle Paul. And when that happened, everything began to change. And I share that with you because some of you, you're so concerned and you're so afraid and you're so uncertain about how to share your faith and how Jesus has transformed you he doesn't want you to live without that power, the same Pentecostal power that he sent that first day. It's for everyone who would call upon the name of the Lord. 
you can experience that indwelling presence of Jesus and you can walk with Christ the whole of your life. But when you become so consumed with reaching family and friends, when you become so consumed with reaching your campus, your classroom, your workplace, your neighborhood, and your world with the good news of Jesus, that's when you get on your knees and you say, Heavenly Father, send the power of the Holy Spirit and baptize me so that I have that strength, that anointing, that ability. And here's what I know about God Almighty. He will not slap you away. And as you pray and as you seek and as you knock, that door will be opened up to you and you'll experience for yourself that same resurrection power that the Holy Spirit sends and fills us to overflowing. Would you pray with me? Spirit of a living God, I need you like never before. We need you like never before. Maybe you'll pray this way. Holy Spirit, I need you like never before. I offer myself to you like never before. I submit myself to you like never before. Help me to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, to do what Jesus did, and to reach the world with the good news of King Jesus. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would seal this work in our hearts today. Thank you for the reminder that in Christ, by faith, you have declared us not guilty. I pray, Father, for that one that's here in this place that senses and feels that distance and doesn't want to leave this place feeling distant from you. If that's you today, I want to invite you to slip up your hand and I want to pray with you for an experience with Jesus, for yourself to experience his saving work. You might put your faith and trust in him. Yes, I see those hands. Father, you've seen those hands that have been raised right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray that as they talk to you, and I encourage you right there in your seat, you may not have all the words, but Jesus looks past all of the words and he sees your heart. He hears the cry of your heart. Jesus, would you save that one, those who have raised their hands, those who have acknowledged here in this place and watching online, faith and trust and hope in you that they might have the blessing of a new peace with you, O oh God, an access to you like never before, confidence and love because of what you've done, Jesus, like never before, and a relationship, a depth of relationship like never before found in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. I pray this in the powerful name of our resurrected Messiah, King Jesus. Amen and amen. Would you stand?